Now we go to a journalistic enterprise of a different nature. Sarush, are you in the room? Are you on stage? So, and are you on your own, Sarush? Are you with your partners? All alone. All alone. So, this fella and a couple of his buddies uh, started a cheeky magazine out of Montreal called Vice. Very appropriate title, tells you pretty much a lot of what you need to know about the attitudes behind the magazine. Then you move down to New York yeah. and are having success after success with uh, unusual journalistic combination. Why don't you tell us about it? Thanks, Moses. <clears throat> I'll grab a bottle of water here. It's uh, describing what we do as journalism is, is uh, is a bit of a stretch, for starters. Um, you know, being in this session with true investigative journalists who I have the utmost respect for, um, I really, you know, what we've done with this magazine has been an exercise in subjectivity. We've just been hacking it out for seven years and, um, but for some reason it worked. And, um, when I was asked to speak at the conference, I, um, <clears throat> was thinking about the name Idea City and, um, on the word idea. And that led to thinking about ideals and idealism. And, um, it led me to think about the idealism which we had when we started our publication. We were idealists. We had come through the Canadian educational system. I went to McGill, my partners had gone to Carleton. Uh, it was incredibly politically correct. Uh, it was 90, early 90s. We came out, we were living in Montreal, and uh, you know, after a couple of years of uh, floating around Eastern Europe and, and um, you know, being uh, somewhat politically engaged, yet nihilistic at the same time, we ended up back in Montreal in a city that had no infrastructure for us at the time. The English community was uh, sparse, you know, it, was, it had fallen apart. And um, we, uh, we were told that we can't do it. You can't do another English publication in Montreal. You already have two news and entertainment weeklies, you have a daily, and then you have all the French publications. And our idealism was very pure, it was very naive. Our attitude was, why can't we? Why can't we do this publication? And um, the ideals that we had when we started the publication really uh, had a lot of, you know, were fueled by hatred. We resented the, you know, conservative. We hated the media, for starters. We hated uh, you know, the majority of the, the, the PC kids that we went to school with and whatnot. And um, <clears throat> so we walked in and we started speaking our mind. And um, it, was a, it was a jihad, in a sense. It was a mission for us. We had to do this publication, um, even though it made no sense to, um, I guess, the the masses, to the mainstream, to traditional models of publishing and journalism. It didn't fit in anywhere. Uh, we, were, we were marginal. We were on the fringes. And that's why I find it so ironic that uh, you know, Moses asked, us, asked me to present here, because for the way I perceive vice, is it's about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And it's, it's been freaking people out for seven years. And, and people don't want to touch us. You know, they're, they're afraid of us on some level. We've had a lot of success in, in growing the business. But I still see us as being, you know, on, on the edge of the abyss. Um, and I think there's a, a cultural trend happening where 
you know, subversive ideas are coming more into the mainstream and, and uh, you know, uh, mainstream multinational corporations, the, the polygrams, the EMIs, the Warner records, are willing to work with a publication such as ours. Um, but it, it, you know, it hasn't been an easy road and we still encounter, uh, you know, problems all the time with all the conservative uh, masses that exist. So, you know, I, I wanted to talk about our um, issues as idealists who are trying to grow a company. What happens to your idealism as something grows? As if, you know, we had um, an attitude that we were going to change things, that we're going to push our ideas, that we're going to show that subjective writing can work, that all of the infrastructure that exists in putting out magazines, it doesn't have to be that way. You know, what I've learned in the last seven years is that a publication can be, it can, uh, you know, media needs to be more of an animal and less of a machine. Like Peter Jennings was saying, back in the day he'd be in Egypt, you know, and he would take a long time to work on a report. Now it's just, it's fast, it's technology. We're gonna show up and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about it. And I think it's, it's possible for, um, to bring the human element back into the media. I think it's sterile. It's incredibly sterile. There are exceptions, of course. Michelle and Juan, Diane, these people are exceptions. There's, as far as I'm concerned, they're superstars in a media that's had the soul sucked out of it. It's incredibly sterile. And um, <clears throat> I, you know, I remember when, um, when we first started the publication, we had a real attitude of anti-censorship. We, uh, both with the advertising and the editorial. We believed that the space that we sold to clients was their space and people could do what they want with it. You could put, uh, we would sell ads to people like Serial Killer Clothing who would have, uh, you know, naked porn stars in their ads, sh full frontal nudity, showing pubic hair, and we would sell ads to White Devil Records, which was Charles Matson's record label. And we would put these ads in this magazine and ship it out across the country. And we thought, there's nothing wrong with that. The people in Saskatchewan are like us. They're going to they're be OK with it. There are people like us in Calgary, in Waterloo, Ontario, in Guelph. And um, you can really find out a lot about a country when you do that exercise. When you ship out, you know, nudity or whatever, um, coast to coast. What we found was, um, you know, we had a father in New Brunswick who made his, he, it, he made it his mission to try and have us banned from the province of New Brunswick. That's, it's a, it's a mighty task. We had, um, a mother from London, Ontario, whose son was caught shoplifting with copies of Vice with him, and, and she made it her mission to have us banned. Carleton University succeeded in banning us from their campus. And all the years of, of being, growing up in Canada, and then I lived in the States for 10 years, I always had this attitude that Canada is a progressive country. We have subsidized education. We have, you know, Medicare. And it wasn't until we sent out Vice Magazine Coast to Coast that I realized that Canada is full of backwards ass rednecks. <laughs> I mean, obviously you have, in the urban centers, you have the really progressive people. But after you send out 30,000 copies of a saucy publication, you've hit your numbers. You start hitting your ceiling. And that's when you get the backlash. The people in, 
I mean, there was something in, in Now magazine, uh, I think this week or last week, talking about this heter heterosexual family pride sex day or whatever it was. I mean, that's insane. That's like, uh, the fact that that's going on in Canada right now is disturbing. And um, so at that point, when we were getting this backlash from Canada, we decided to start shipping our mags down to the States. And as Michael Adams pointed out this morning, America's no better. In fact, it's far worse. But their problem is not with sex. They don't have a problem with pubic hair. What they have a problem with is race. Um, and then, you know, the 90% of the country is, uh, is full of rednecks as well. But <laughs> my point being is that we hit a ceiling in Canada, but the people that we are talking to in Vice, there's a lot more of them in America. We can put out 100,000 magazines in America and it's not enough, and we're getting to our demographic. But the politically correct saga continues. I mean, in America, it, it really revolves around race quite a bit. Um, you know, part of our editorial mandate was, was really to keep it raw and to keep it real and to talk in our articles how we spoke amongst ourselves. So we had no problems using the words packy or chink or nigger. It was not used in a racist context. It was, but we thought, why should we not publish it because every other newspaper in Canada doesn't publish it. So let's just see what happens. And, you know, the Canadians were okay with that. Um, in America, on the other hand, we have some issues with that. We had, uh, last week, um, a seven-foot-tall, 350-pound black man who came into our store in New York. We have stores as well with our, our magazine. It's kind of spun off into a, a retail uh, thing as well. But we had this guy come in, and he was like, you know, he wanted to know what the context was. Why would you use the N word in a publication? And he said, if you're going to use it, use nega. Don't use nigger. If you have an A on the end, it's okay. You know, I mean, that's like you, you try and hide from, uh, you know, the whatever. You, you, you try and disempower uh, political correctness and you get in trouble for it. You know, that's what, for us, for the last seven years, we've been sticking to our ideals, which were, you know, let's, um, let's be ourselves and let's go uh, the opposite. Let's do what the, you know, uh, masses um, aren't accepting right now because we believe in it. And you end up burning bridges and you get in trouble and you make enemies. Um, you know, and we don't get shot at. We may get threatened in our store. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I don't take it too seriously. I know that this is not, um, you know, we're, I, I, we do have a deep respect for investigative journalism. I mean, if we had the resources and the budgets, we would include articles uh, that tried to expose something we have in the past. You know, there was one time when, um, we, our editor for a good year was part of the Montreal criminal underworld. And, um, you know, our entire editorial staff consisted of prostitutes, strippers, junkies, um, recovering addicts. And that was, and we, you know, our editorial was a, a forum for these relatively unheard voices. And um, he had an article which he wrote called uh, 27 Tons of Hash, and it was, uh, you know, about the RCMP's smuggling hashish, and he had photos to prove it, and it was a great, it was what we refer to as a bomb. It was amazing. Um, and then, you know, the, the person who was involved in the smuggling had been arrested, and he was facing a, a court date, and our editor at the time, the, the, the criminal, uh, <laughs> told us, you can't run it. And we're like, we're going to the printer, and uh, it's too late. 
which was a lie because we just wanted to run the article. It was great. Um, <laughs> what happened was he showed up to our office with a shoebox full of cash, and uh, he said, uh, you guys can't run this. If you run it, I'm going to have to whack you guys. So that's, I just want to tell you that story that, you know, like, we, we do have our, uh, our moments of peril. And I don't know why that is. I guess with, whenever you get involved in newspapers and in publishing, you know, it's the power of the pen, even if we're, uh, we're not trained journalists. Um, the Na National Post wrote an article on this recently, and um, uh, they, they mentioned that our, our net annual revenues for Vice were 3.7 million US, which was a mistake. It's actually 3.7 million gross, but there's a huge difference in that. <laughs> and no matter how much fact checking you do, you, you can still screw it up. And you know the, the Ryerson School of uh, Review of Journalism, they wrote a big article on, on this last month. And their fact checker called me after it had been written and he said, is it true that you have a beard? I mean, this is the kind of facts he was checking. And his next fact that he was checking was, is it true that you wear glasses? And I was appalled, I was shocked. This is what they're teaching in Canadian journalism schools? I mean, it's, you know, I, I really wish we could, um, you know, restructure the way magazines operate. And, and uh, I mean, I guess that's why we do our magazine the way we do. Um, so, uh, as our as our company grew over the last seven years, we were forced to um, re reconsider our ideals at certain points um, because we were so naive. We were like, you know, we're really punk rock. We're really DIY. We're gonna speak our minds. We're going to be politically incorrect. We're going to offend people. We're going to burn our bridges. But we want to be millionaires. <laughs> we were greedy. And we thought, we can go against the mainstream and talk shit about everybody, but we can be bigger than Spin Magazine. And that's been our attitude from day one. And that still is our attitude. And maybe that's completely insane. But um, you know, if you believe it strongly enough, you can get away with a lot, and um, and so you know we've had this, we've had a pretty good run with it. Um, we're straddling a fence where we want to, we don't want to sell our editorial out, yet we don't want to end up broke at the end of the day, and it's a paradox. You know we're we're conflicted as a publication, as a company. Um, we have our, our ideals and our integrity, which at times it, you, you have to reassess. And I think as you get older, you're willing to make certain concessions and adjust your ideals and adapt them. We had somebody who invested in our company. Um, he owned Shift Magazine uh, before he bought a piece of our company. Luckily, he was, you know, insane as well. He was an eccentric millionaire, and, uh, and he indulged our ideas. And so he, let, he gave us a lot of freedom. At a certain point, he invested enough into our company to take control, to take a majority stake, to take 51%. And at that point, he, you know, he knew all along, he's a smart guy, that you can't you know, increase your circulation above 100,000 copies unless you start fluffing up the content and tone it down, do something more mainstream. And he asked us to do that. And that, that was something that we couldn't do. But it was a problem because we no longer had control. Luckily, at that time, the whole new economy fell apart. The dot-com industry collapsed, and um, he started divesting all of his properties. And, uh, and we got an opportunity to buy back our company. So 
we didn't actually have to, uh, we were on the verge of, of, you know, butting heads with the, the, the company that owned us uh, about maintaining our editorial uh, and keeping the focus. And um, so now we have a second chance. We're in America. We moved to New York. We have an office in Brooklyn. And um, we're growing. And we, you know, we have our, our copies in Canada, and then we have our copies in America. And we're facing the same issues in America that we did in Canada, where our circulation's hitting the point now where our readership, who are devoted to us, it's like, you know, like a cult-like following. These kids are obsessed. They're there, but now we're increasing and we're, you know, getting in trouble. And uh, I don't know, I don't have the answers about what's going to happen in the future with us. Um, it's interesting to see where we're going to go with it. Um, and when I was asked to speak for this conference, it gave me an opportunity to really assess what happened with our company from day one until now. And I see um, us being so completely marginalized and then coming into, uh, you know, to the mainstream to a certain extent. I'll open up uh, Gear Magazine, which is uh, Guccione's publication, Spin, and these magazines have my writers writing for them. People that used to write for us or still write for us, but they're now getting paid a dollar a word to write for these publications, writing the same kind of content. So I'm, you know, it's, it's scary because you have what you had, what you thought was unique and you're separate, you're on the fringes, and all of a sudden you're being invited to speak at Idea City. <laughs> well, that's a familiar, <laughs> that's uh, a familiar trajectory and uh, it's probably the first time I've been accused of uh, dragging somebody into the establishment, but um, interestingly <laughs> enough uh, about that, uh, I, I mentioned that I had uh, received, I'd been honored with an honorary doctorate, and uh, there was the inevitable dinner that followed on that, and uh, we were in the York Club um, having this fine dinner with all the usual suspects at the table, and I must tell you, Sarush, the only argument that ensued that night was no one was prepared to admit that they were in the establishment. <laughs> so you may be onto something. And uh, well, I look forward to uh, yeah. reports from the field yeah, and right. uh, the tension between your idealism and that million bucks. We'll let you know. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.